could be a long weekend in Washington, D.C. The media, the media continues to unify. Big tech comes clean. And I think Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is a Republican plant. This is Gene, and you're listening to Dumbasses Talking Politics. Hey, hey, this is Gene. Welcome back to Dumbasses Talking Politics, the Friday edition, and this will be the last podcast of the week, so I'm kind of excited. Um, but we've got to see exactly what's going to happen this weekend. There's been a lot of online chatter, and the disaster of an attack on Congress... Uh, and with the disaster of an attack on Congress last week, police officials are afraid there may be attacks on Washington, D.C. and other state capitals this weekend. And this could be a problem all the way to Inauguration Day on Wednesday, which is a tragedy because I've actually got court on Wednesday and I got to deal with my ex-wife on Wednesday I'm go- I there's I could quite possibly miss everything. This is going to be terrible. Tourist spots like Was- the Washington Monument have been closed due to the threat. There have also been 20,000 That's right. 20,000 two with four zeros National Guard troops deployed in Washington DC, specifically in the Capitol building. It's really depressing to watch those poor guys. They have to actually sleep in the halls. It's so it's very bad. Fencing that is eight feet high is around the White House in the area where the inauguration will be held. Um, and it has been, it's being guarded. It looks pretty bad. So President Trump who has been rather quiet lately, released a Twitter video on the presidential account. Um, For some reason, Twitter decided not to censor that account. Um, I'm going to read his information. I'm not going to actually play the video. No, I'm going to play the video. It's kind of I'm going to read it because it's really too long. I could read it so much faster. Okay, quote, My fellow Americans, I want to speak to you tonight about the troubling events of the past week. As I have said, the incursion of the U.S. Capitol struck at the very heart of the Republic. It angered and appalled millions of Americans across the political spectrum. I want to be very clear. I unequivocally, unequivocally condemn the violence that we saw last week. Violence and vandalism has absolutely no place in our country and no place in our movement. Making great America making America great again has always been about defending the rule of law, supporting the men and women of law enforcement, and upholding our nation's most sacred traditions and values. Mob violence goes against everything I believe in and everything our movement stand for stands for. Okay, so this is this part is basically saying that, you know, something I I effed up. Uh I need to make amends for it. Don't impeach me. Don't ruin my legacy. I made a mistake. Fine. Quote, no true supporter of mine could ever endorse political violence. No true supporter of mine could ever disrespect the law. In, uh, law enforcement or our great American flag. No true supporter of mine could ever threaten or harass their fellow Americans. If you do any of these things, you are not supporting our movement. You're attacking it. You, and you are attacking our country. We cannot tolerate it. Tragically, over the course of the past year, made so difficult by the COVID-19, notice he didn't say China virus, We have seen political violence spiral out of control. We have seen too many riots, too many mobs, too many acts of intimidation and destruction. It must stop. Whether you are on the right or on the left, a Democrat or a Republican, there is never a justification for violence. No excuses, no exception. This is great because what he's basically saying is that violence is violence. It's all bad. 
period. It doesn't matter where it's coming from. And you know, I pointed out that he said COVID-19 and not the COVID virus is because he's trying to communicate with all people. And, and that's a good thing. He is also, uh, this could be considered a dog whistle, sitting back and saying, hey, I got news for you. Did the left do this shit back in freaking the summer? No, they didn't. So that's a that's what I'd call a dog whistle. At least it hit my head. Okay, continue. Quote, America is a nation of laws. Those who engaged in attacks last week will be brought to justice. Now I'm asking everyone who has ever believed in the agenda to be thinking of ways to ease tensions, calm tempers, and to help promote peace in our country. There has been reporting that additional demonstrations are being planned in the coming days, both here and in Washington and across the country. I have been briefed by the U.S. Secret Service on the potential threats. Every American deserves to have their voice heard in respect and pe- respectful and peaceful ways. This is your First Amendment right. Again, this is great. This is America first. Trump did not come up with this speech. It This speech was written for him, and whoever wrote it did a great job. So this is America first. This is... Follow the Constitution. That's why he said, have their voice heard in respectful and peaceful ways. This is your First Amendment right. Excellent. So let's move on. Quote, but I cannot emphasize that there is must be no violence, no law-breaking, no vandalism of any kind. Everyone must follow our laws and obey our instructions of law enforcement. I have directed federal agencies to use the necessary resources to maintain order. In Washington, D.C., we bring, we are bringing in thousands of National Guard members to secure the city and ensure the transition can occur safely and without incident. Like all of you, I was shocked and deeply saddened by the calamity at the Capitol last week. I want to thank the hundreds of millions of incredible American citizens who have responded to this moment with calm and grace. This is also a very excellent... First off, he's saying that what happened was bad. What happened was really bad. And now he's putting the National Guard and the police uh, against... Anything that could happen this weekend. So if someone, let's say he's a right winger, he's a conservative, decides to attack uh, the inauguration, let's go from there. He is distancing himself for that. This is the distancing paragraph in his speech. He's also sitting back and saying, hey, I'm not president anymore in Five days, I'm not going to be president anymore. Let's have a smooth transition. But what he's also doing here is he's separating the radical right from the regular conservative. This is awesome. Let's continue. What is needed now is for us to listen to one another, not to silence one another. Okay, remember that statement. I'm going to come up with it. All of us can choose our actions to rise above the rancer and find common ground and shared purposes. We must focus on advancing the interests of the whole nation, delivering the miracle of vaccines, defeating the pandemic, rebuilding the economy, protecting our national security, and upholding the rule of law. Again, he is really pushing a nationalist. Not a white nationalist, not a black nationalist. There's no KKK dog dog whistle here. He's pushing a national narrative that a lot of conservatives believe on. And when I say nationalist, I mean American. Not American. I, I live with 16 other Hispanics, they're Americans. 
I worked with black people. They're Americans. They're all nationalists. They believe in the United States of America. What he's basically saying is America defeated the virus. Is this a dog whistle? Effing A it is. This is fantastic. But the big sentence, what is needed now for us to listen to one another, not to silence one another? This is counter to Joe Biden's narrative. Joe Biden is not about unity. He's not about unity. He's about, I'm going to do what I want. You can support me or shut the F up. This is a counter to to Joe Biden. The last paragraph. Today I'm calling for Americans to overcome the passions of the moment and to join together as one American people. Let us choose to move forward, united, for the good of our families, our communities, and our country. Thank you. God bless you. And God bless God bless America. You know, it would have been nice if Trump said this earlier. I I can't lie. I wish Trump had said this earlier. But his signature phrase, thank you, God bless you, and God bless America, this is important stuff because that's what this country was built on. So let's go, let's take a look at the left and their unifying message. Biden uses that famous dog whistle thing they always say Trump uses. You know, he says that we should unify, but the code for we are going to do what we want and you should shut the F up. Well, the media isn't hiding it, nor are they hiding the hatred they have for conservatives. CNN, who is no longer who no longer will be played in airports, by the way, that's a true thing, said that anyone who voted for Donald Trump is a, was a Nazi and a KKK member. It did not matter that people like me and you like Trump's policies. It was just because we are bigoted, homophobic, xenophobic, misogynistic, racist, who along belong to the KKK, Nazis, and Proud Boys all at once. It's hard to believe that Chris Cuomo is the one trying to calm Don Lemon down here, but it's true. That doesn't make Chris Cuomo a hero of conservatives or anything, but he knows what Don Lemon, he knows that Don Lemon is making a severely grandiose statement that is very divisive. So listen to this. Now what you hear is, well, you can't say that everybody who voted for Trump is like the people who went into the Capitol. Response. You can't say that what everybody's like. Everybody who voted for Trump is like them. And now I just explained to you, if you if if you are on that side, you need to think about the side you're on. I am never on the side of the Klan. I am never principal people, conservative or liberal, never on the Klan side. Principal people, conservative or liberal, never on the Nazi side. Principal people who are conservative or liberal, never on the side that treats their their fellow Americans as less than that says that your fellow Americans should not exist, that says, your, that says your fellow Americans should be in a concentration camp, or that sides with slavery, or sides with any sort of bigotry. Right, and if they Prince say, of, I don't agree with those people, I just like Trump's policy. Well, then get out of the crowd with him. Get out of the crowd I with him. I wasn't in the crowd, I just voted for Trump. You're in the crowd who voted for Trump. If you voted for Trump, you voted for the person who the Klan supported. You voted for the person who Nazis support. You voted for the person who the alt-right supports. That's the crowd that you are in. You voted for the person who incited a crowd to go into the Capitol and, and potentially take the lives of lawmakers, took the lives of police officers, took the lives of innocent lives who were there on the Capitol that day. You voted on that side and the people in Washington are continuing to vote on that side. There is so much wrong with what Don Lemon said. Okay, so let's go over a couple of things. 
The people who voted Trump are not on the side of the Klan. This is a generalization, and we are going to hear... I'm going to talk about this a little bit right after I give you my points here. Um, people who voted Trump are not on the side of the Nazis. Same thing. And by the way, uh, the big problem with this one, Nazis stand for National Socialist German Workers Party in German. The Nazis were left-wingers. Conservatives are principled. We believe in the freedom of religion, freedom of speech, free press, and the, the ability to protect their rights with a gun if they have to. We also believe that killing babies is wrong. Conservatives don't believe in concentration camps or slaveries. Conservatives ended slavery because it was wrong. Uh, where, the where were the concentration camps? Left-wing Germany, left-wing Soviet Union called Gulags, Cuba, China. China just sent tens of thousands of Uyghurs to a concentration camp to be sterilized and reprogrammed. That just happened literally three weeks ago. Because you like Trump's policies doesn't mean you like Trump personally. Trump is a creepy guy. If someone votes for Trump because they are a KKK member, doesn't mean I voted for Trump because I sympathize with the KKK. I just hated Hillary. Is that really a bad thing? Finally, Richard Spencer, alt-right loon, voted for Joe Biden. Alt-right loon and white, an actual white supremacist endorsed Joe Biden in the 2020 election. And the reason? Because Trump wasn't hard enough on the Jews. Don't forget, it's alt-right, white supremacists. It's not just about blacks. It's also about Jews. They forget that. If you don't believe me, go to www.dumbassestalkingpolitics.com. Look at the post. It's there. He said it. Finally, every conservative I talk to, do not panic about Biden being president and did not support the riots at Congress. We thought it was disgusting, just like what we thought with the BLM and Antifa riots, which, by the way, cost $2 billion in damage, and the left supported it. One thing here that I really need to point out is the embrace of intersectionality. I want you to remember this because this happened before and it's seriously dangerous. The left believes that there is no individual. We are all made up in groups. They break up people into race, sexual orientation, gender, which, by the way, isn't a thing. Sex and gender are the same thing. Class, and to some extent, religion. For example, the left will embrace Muslims or Islamists. <coughs> <coughs> but they will ridicule and condemn Catholics and Jews. But anyone on the right had been classified, everyone on the right has been classified in their own group. And that group is Nazis and white supremacists. In other words, we've been grouped as evil. This is dangerous. And this is what leads to concentration camps. This is what leads to gulags. This is the new narrative. All conservatives are evil. Nazi, racist, white supremacists, because they like Trump. And there are some mama's basement dwellers who decided to storm the Capitol building makes this whole thing freaking true. We're evil. So we must be purged. Is that a comforting thought?
So let's get into social media. Um, Here's the hypocrisy of the week. There is a presidential election happening in Uganda. The government of Uganda is afraid that bad information is going to pass through social media and that it might affect the election. So they decided to block all social media traffic into the country until the election was over. One of the companies, surprise, was Twitter. Twitter public policy account posted this tweet. Quote, ahead of the Ugandan election, we are hearing reports of internet service providers being ordered to block social media and messaging apps. We strongly condemn the internet shutdowns. They are hugely harmful, violate basic human rights, and the principles of hashtag open, open internet. They released another statement a couple of seconds later. Quote, access to information of, and freedom of expression including the public conversation on Twitter is never more important than during the democratic process, particularly elections. Hashtag Uganda Decides 2021. Hashtag Keep It On. Do you see the irony? This company censors material, including an article about the true story of Hunter Biden and closed the president's account. Needless to say, Twitter exploded. So, so, so Rob Armani, Amari said this on Twitter, the gall, my lord pre-election freedom of information for Ugandans, but not for the readers of the oldest newspaper, the New York Post. Don't forget, the New York Post was founded by, um, I think it was Madison. I can't remember who did it. Molly from The Federalist said, You banned the sharing of accurate journalism that was negative for your preferred candidate during the 2020 election. An egregious tampering with freedom of expression and the public conversation in the midst of an important Democratic Congress. Jason Rance of KTTH Radio said, I honestly can't stop thinking of this tweet. Twitter censored the world's oldest newspaper from posting the story on the leading candidate for president and stopped us from sharing it, then banned a city and sitting you, then banned uh, okay, well, I'm going to read this. Then banned at sitting U.S. president plus allied accounts. They're probably talking about um, Michael Flynn, who was banned, and uh, a couple other people. After the party charged, the party in charge asked them to. Um, Ali Beth Stuckey, who is from Blaze TV, said. They think you're stupid, and she's talking to us that actually subscribe to Twitter. Josh Hammer finally said, didn't at Jack, which is Jack Dorsey, literally react to Parler with a heart emoji? Emoji, excuse me. Uh, Parler, of course, was taken down by Amazon and may never come back up. What's good for me is not for thee, as far as social media companies see it. So, Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter, said that he didn't want to ban Trump and even thinks it might might have been dangerous to do so. Wow, really? You think? In his statement, listen to this, this is great. I do not celebrate or feel pride for having banned Donald Trump's from Twitter or how we got here. After a clear warning, we we take this action. We made a decision with the best information we had based on the threats to physical safety both on and off Twitter. Was this correct? 
I believe that it was the right decision for Twitter. We faced an extraordinary and unattainable circumstance, forcing us to focus all our actions on public safety. Offline harm as a result of online speech is demonstrable, demonstrably real. And what And what drives our policy and enforcement above all? That said, having a to ban an account has a real and significant ramifications. While there are clear and obvious exceptions, I feel that the ban is a failure of ours ultimately to promote a healthy conversation. Remember that. That's me saying it's not Jack Dorsey saying it and a time for us to reflect on our operations and environment around us, having to take actions, fragment the public conversation. They divide us. They limit the potential for the clarification, redemption, and learning, and sets a precedent I feel is dangerous. The power of the individual or corporation has over the global public conversation. So, end quote. So what is he saying? He's saying that they are responsible for healthy conversation on Twitter. That healthy conversation is that the left has the left and nothing else. Left's opinions matter. That's not really the issue. He said this uh, because the stock for Twitter is dropping like a rock right now. And this is only going to get worse. You know why I know this? Jack Dorsey said it in a private phone conversation obtained by Project Veritas. Listen to this. This is a trip. You should always feel free to express yourself in whatever format, manifestation feels right. We do intend to do a full retro, as I said in my note. It is going to take some time. Um, and then the, the other thing, just to just to close out a little bit, we you know we, we are focused on one account right now, but this is going to be much bigger than just one account, and it's going to go on for much longer than just this day, this week, or the next few weeks. It's going to go on beyond the inauguration. We have to expect that. We have to be ready for that. So the focus is certainly on this account and uh, how it ties to real world violence, but also we need to think much longer term around how these dynamics play out over time. Um, I don't believe this is going away anytime soon. And the moves that we're making today uh, around uh, QAnon, for instance, is one such example of a much broader approach um, that we should be looking at um, and, and going deeper on. So um, the team has a lot of work and a lot of focus on this particular issue. Uh, we also need to give them the space and the support to focus on the, the much bigger picture uh, because it is it is not going away. Um, you know, the, the U.S. is extremely divided. Um, our platform is uh, showing that uh, every single day, and our role is to protect the integrity of that conversation uh, and do what we can to make sure that no one is being harmed uh, based off that. And, and that is the focus, and um, that is the, the color we're going to provide. There you have it, Jack Dorsey, CEO of Twitter, recorded by one of his own employees, an insider whistleblower at Twitter, recorded saying this is going to be much bigger than just one account, revealing some censorship. You can see our motto at Veritas, our organization protected by an army of citizen patriots. We've had over a dozen people reach out to us this week with video, evidence inside Twitter. Stay tuned. They may be private companies, but they have more power than all three branches of government. Veritas Tips at protonmail.com. So there you have it. I'm not even going to bother asking folks to follow me on Twitter anymore. I've lost 300 subscribers in the last week. That doesn't sound like a lot, but I only had over 300, 600, excuse me. Um, yeah, the purge has begun. It's pretty bad. 
head of Instagram, Adam Masori, said that we all knew what we all knew. There is bias at Facebook, Instagram, uh, Facebook. Uh, Facebook is owned by, is, Facebook owns Instagram. So he's the president of actually Instagram. Masori said, quote, we're not neutral. No platform is neutral. We all have values. Those values influence the decisions we make. We try and be apolitical, but that's increasingly difficult, especially in the United States, where people are more and more polarized. Of course, it's probably more difficult when you've got the Democratic Party breathing down your neck, and now they own all forms of Congress. The Instagram head was responding to a comment by tech writer Will Ormus regarding Facebook announcement of Roy Austin, a formerly a formerly an Obama administration of the Obama, Obama administration to serve as Facebook's VP of civil rights. That's, that's awesome. Roy Austin Jr. has been named the vice president of civil rights with the mandate to oversee Facebook's accountability of racial hatred and discrimination on the platform. He's slated to start January 19th. That's from uh, NPR. What a shock. The, uh, the inauguration is January 20th. Will Aramis had pointed out to this uh, on Twitter. He said, this feels like kind of a move Facebook could have made five plus years ago if it hadn't been so intent at the time of portraying itself as a neutral platform and promoting online connection as an absolute good. Though I don't think this will happen again in the near future, when the tech bros are called in front of Congress, they better not be telling how neutral they are. It could lead to a per uh, perjury charge. It's all so freaking disgusting and so obvious. Uh okay, in the last story today, I know I'm running long, but, you know, there's so much. You know, I love AOC. I should put her words on this podcast and my blog more often or subscribe to her Instagram account because she is where the Democratic lift left gives us an indication of what they're thinking. Believe it or not, AOC is the perfect spy for Republicans. If I was a politician, I would quote her, a Republican politician, I would quote every word from her and I would say it over and over and over again. Like this little statement she made on Instagram this week. I think it was on Tuesday. I, wow, if this is the state of the Democratic left, this is something that really needs to be brought up, but it doesn't seem like it's something that's ever talked about. Listen. Any discussion in Congress about federal truth and reconciliation or media literacy initiatives to help with healing? I definitely, so there, I can't say, I, I don't think that the response, the, that this kind of like medium term response has um, fully crystallized yet. But what I can say is that there's absolutely a commission that's being discussed, but it, it seems to be more investigatory um, in style rather than truth and reconciliation. Um, and so I think that's an interesting concept for us to explore. Um, and, you know, I do think that uh, several members of Congress in some of my discussions have brought up uh, media literacy because that is a part of what happened here. Um, and we're going to have to figure out how we reign in our media environment so that you can't just spew disinformation and misinformation. It's one thing to have differing opinions, but um, it's another thing entirely to just say things that are false. Um, and so that's something that we're looking into. A council for media literacy? Really? What is the purpose of that, I wonder? No, I don't wonder. It's exactly what it sounds like. Democrats are toying with an idea to create a council to determine which news agencies are relevant and which are telling, quote, 
lies, end quote. Quote, lies, end quote, being defined as anything that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and her brethren don't agree with. This is extremely da uh, dangerous. First, create a council. Next, call people to testify and browbeat them. No debate, mind you. Just tell them how they're wrong and make them defend themselves. Three, hopefully you can catch a couple of people in a lie and then you can persecute them for perjury. Does that sound familiar? Finally, when this bureaucratic crap comes to fruition, find cause to condemn and jail people. Here's the thing. The government is not allowed to create any laws that abridge or restrict the rights of the press. The left-wing press, the right-wing press, the moderate press. I didn't make that up. It's the First Amendment of the Constitution. And the Democrats always seem to forget about the Constitution. A council like this is made to actually restrict the legitimacy of the press, specifically the right-wing press. I'm not so sure this particular group would be constitutional, but again, the, the Democrats don't care about the Constitution. They prove it over, I mean, Nancy Pelosi, we talked yesterday where she tr wrote a bill to implement the 25th Amendment, and the Congress has nothing to do with the 25th Amendment. Just have to read it. Here's another, and here's another genius moment from AOC. Listen to this. Affiliated tattoos because it would make it easier for them to, um, to get into law enforcement. Because if you have those tattoos, um, you get disqualified. You can be disqualified quite early. So. Um, I say that because it just indicates just a crumb of the work that we have to do um, because a lot of people have, have drank the poison of white supremacy. Um, and that's what Donald Trump represents, just is. And if at this point you haven't recognized that and you don't see it, um, maybe you have a lot of work to do too. Um, maybe we have a lot of work to do. Um, but that's a real big issue that we have. Um, someone said, I'm seeing here $2,000 checks. Is that also a priority? Yes, it is a priority. There are so many problems with this statement that she makes especially having a tattoo would disqualify you from being a cop. I don't know what she's talking about. Most cops I know have tattoos. But the main thing, problem with this whole thing is to vilify anyone who has supported Donald Trump. And that's really what it comes down to. Period. Supporting Donald Trump was not drinking the poison of white supremacy. There is absolutely zero evidence Donald Trump is a white supremacist and a ton of evidence that he actually cares about Americans, no matter their color. His policies helped all Americans, not just white people. That is the poison that has been ingested by AOC, the Democrats, and the younger generations. The lies of the schools, the media, Hollywood, and other institutions corrupted by socialism and its ideals. I don't blame her for being poisoned and being dumb, but I do blame her for not having the courage to actually debate someone who knows what he, she is talking about. She is so arrogant and power hungry. She cannot risk to have her little world rocked by someone like Ben Shapiro, Candace Owens, Dave Rubin, Tucker Carlson, Sean Hannity, Stephen Crowder, or Laura Ingram. That would she would rather suppress those ideas than actually deal with them and actually try and convince others. Also, notice that she says, quote, you have a lot of work to do, or maybe 
we have a lot of work to do. She's basically saying, I, who is, I, me, me personally, who is a Trump supporter, needs to change myself, or maybe she needs to change me. It has to be a force. Curtailing right-wing media, censorship, cancel culture, or dare I say it, prosecution. That's the only way she's going to change someone like me. Not that her ideas are good. They, sh they suck. They've never worked in anything in the world. She could change people's minds on the right by debating her position and proving that her position is superior. Of course, she won't be able to do that because her position has never actually succeeded anywhere in human history. Yes, AOC, we've had socialism. It has failed every time miserably I might add and usually costing hundreds of thousands of deaths okay um, you can follow you can download or listen to his podcast on Apple podcast podbean podcast addict um, twitcher and YouTube you can visit my website at www.dumbassestalkingpolitics.com uh, you want to follow me on Twitter, you can. You can read it and copy and paste it. I just don't care about Twitter anymore. Parlor is disconnected and may never come back, so forget it. Uh, this is Gene, and you've listened to Dumbasses Talking Politics. <laughs>